In this physcast, we want to review Bernoulli's equation, understand what the terms mean, and how they can be applied to a series of situations where we have fluid flow through a pipe. Firstly, it's important to realise that Bernoulli's equation applies to incompressible fluids that are undergoing laminar flow, so no turbulence, and that the fluids have no internal friction. This means we can use Bernoulli's equation for flow of water and oil, but not flow of toothpaste, where the viscosity is very high. Another thing of point is that Bernoulli's equation arises due to conservation of energy. That's a big idea in physics. If I look at the terms, they look familiar. So I've got pressure as the first term. I've got something which looks like kinetic energy. And my third term looks like potential energy. And the sum of these three terms at one point in the fluid is constant. So are these energies? Well, not quite. Remembering that kinetic energy, we can write as a half times mass times velocity squared. That's not what we have there. We've got a half times rho times v squared, where rho is the density. In order to get the density, I can remember that mass divided by volume is density. So in fact, this term is not kinetic energy, but it's kinetic energy density. The third term looks like potential energy. That's m times g times h. Once again, this isn't the mass, this is the density and density is mass divided by volume. So this third term here is actually the potential energy density. The kinetic energy and the potential energy both have the units of joule. And if I divide joules by a volume, joules per meter cubed, that's an energy density. Similarly, mgh is the units of joules divided by a volume is energy density. Let's have a look at the first term though. The pressure, is that an energy density? Remembering that pressure can be written as force divided by area, the units of force are newtons and the units of area are meters squared. Is that an energy density? There's a relation between energy joules and, and newtons which we can get from the equation for work. Work remember is force times distance so we can write down that a joule must be equal to one newton per meter. Conversely I can write that one newton is equal to one joule per meter. So one newton is one joule per meter multiplying by meters squared on the denominator gives me meters cubed. So pressure is also an energy density. So in fact Bernoulli's equation is really just conservation of energy density. So now what I want to look at is how we can apply Bernoulli's equation to a series of situations. First of all, let's have a look at a uniform horizontal pipe, which has a fluid flowing to the right. And what I want to consider is how does Bernoulli's equation relate the pressure at point one to the pressure at point two. Firstly, the cross-sectional area at point one and point two is the same. So from conservation of mass, we would have seen that the continuity equation arises. The area of one times the velocity of at point one to the area at point two times the velocity at point two. This is just saying that the volume flow rate is constant. Whatever volume enters from point one must also leave from point two. And from this situation, we can see that V1 must equal V2. To use Bernoulli's equation to understand what's going on with the pressure here, then we need to look at each term in Bernoulli's equation. First of all, let's have a look at the kinetic energy density term. Because V1 is equal to V2, we can write down that the kinetic energy density at point one must be the same as the kinetic energy density at point two. That's because the density of the fluid doesn't change along the pipe. Remember, it's an incompressible fluid, so its density has to be fixed. Because it's a horizontal pipe, then we can have a look at the potential energy density term. This means that the height of the fluid at point 1 must be the same as the height of the fluid at point 2. There's no height difference between point 1 or point 2. Therefore, the potential energy density, rho gh, evaluated at point 1, rho gh1, must be equal to the potential energy density evaluated at point 2. That's because h1 equals h2. What does this mean for the pressure? Well, remembering Bernoulli's equation tells me that the sum of these three terms is equal to a constant of the system. So if these two terms are the same, therefore the pressure at point 1 must also equal the pressure at point 2. That kind of makes sense. We have equal pressures inside the pipe. Let's have a look at another situation. Now we have a situation where we have a horizontal pipe, but there's a constriction. Once again, the fluid's flowing to the right, and I can look at the properties of the fluid at point one and compare them to point two. From the continuity equation, we can see the cross-sectional area at point two is less than the cross-sectional area at point one. This implies velocity of point two must be greater than the velocity of point one, or V1 is less than V2. The fluid must flow faster through point two in order for the volume flow rate to be the same. We can now look at the three terms for Bernoulli's equation and ask ourselves what happens at the pressure at point two. So we've got the pressure term, we've got the kinetic energy density term, and we've got the potential energy density term. And the sum of these three must be a constant. Because the pipe is horizontal, once again, we can say that the height at point one must be the same as the height at point two. That implies that the potential energy density term 
is a constant of the system. Rho g h1 is equal to rho g h2. It doesn't change. However, because the velocities are different, we know that the kinetic energy density term half rho v1 squared must be less than a half rho v2 squared. There's a higher kinetic energy density at point 2 compared to point 1. Bernoulli's equation tells me that if the kinetic energy density is higher at point 2, therefore the energy density associated with the pressure at point 2 must be less than the pressure at point 1. So on this diagram here, the pressure at point 2 is less than the pressure at point 1, or the pressure at point 1 is greater than the pressure at point 2. So what the continuity equation and Bernoulli's equation tell us is that at a constriction, not only do I have an increase in the fluid's velocity, I also have a decrease in the pressure inside the fluid. Let's have a look at a third case now where we deal with a height change. I now want to consider a pipe where the cross-sectional area is the same, once again the fluid's flowing to the right, but now there's a decrease in the height of the pipe as the fluid flows. The continuity equation, once again, tells us that the velocity at point one, the top of the pipe, compared to point two, the bottom of the pipe, those velocities must be the same. They must be the same because the cross-sectional areas are the same. We can now consider those three terms in Bernoulli's equation, the pressure, the kinetic energy density, and the potential energy density. Well, the kinetic energy density terms are the same because the velocities are the same. What changes is the potential energy density. Potential energy density at point one must be greater than the potential energy density at point two because point one is higher up. Bernoulli's equation tells us that some of these three terms must be equal to a constant. Therefore, if the potential energy term on the right is lower at point 2, that tells me that the pressure at point 2 must be greater than the pressure at point 1. So in this case here, the pressure at point 2 is now greater than the pressure at point 1. Another way of thinking about this is remembering that pressure increases with depth. So if my fluid flow velocity was to get smaller and smaller, this would just become a hydrostatic problem and I would realise that the pressure at point 2 should be higher than the pressure at point 1 because it's at a greater depth. Let's see if we can combine the two situations now and understand when we have a constriction and a change in height. And once again, we want to consider what's happening at point 1 and point 2. So what does Bernoulli's equation tell us about the pressure at point 1 compared to the pressure at point 2? Is P2 less than P1 because of the constriction? Is P2 greater than P1? because of the change in height? Or is P2 equal to P1 because you have both situations? Well, all of those three situations can potentially arise, but it depends upon the magnitude of the change in the kinetic energy and the magnitude of the change in the potential energy. Once again, Bernoulli's equation must always hold. From the continuity equation, we know that the velocity at point two must be greater than the velocity at point one. That certainly tells me that the kinetic energy density at point two must be greater than the kinetic energy density at point one. We know that point two is lower than point one, so the potential energy density at point one must be greater than the potential energy density at point two, because point one is higher up than point two. So what does this mean about the pressures? Well, in order to look at the situation, what we really need to do is write down Bernoulli's equation at point one and at point two. I'm going to bring the pressures onto one side of the equation. So P1 minus P2 has to equal, let's have a look on the other side of the equation, bringing everything across. I can have a look at the half rho V2 squared minus a half rho V1 squared plus rho G H2 minus rho G H1. If I think about what these terms mean, this here is the change in the kinetic energy density plus the change in the potential energy density. If I look at these two terms, remembering that from my situation, the velocity at point two is greater than the velocity at point one, the change in kinetic energy density is always positive the way I've written the equation here. Conversely, the potential energy at point two, because the height at point two is smaller than the height at point one, the potential energy density is always a negative. In a situation where the magnitude of the change in kinetic energy density is exactly equal to the magnitude of the change in potential energy density, then the sum of these two terms here will be zero. In that case, 
the pressure at point 1 exactly equals the pressure at point 2 because the magnitude of the change in the kinetic energy density is exactly the same as the magnitude of the change in the potential energy density. So the potential energy density that the fluid loses by decreasing in height is exactly balanced by the increase in the kinetic energy density as the fluid flows faster from that constriction. I can also have the situation where the magnitude of the kinetic energy density is larger than the magnitude of the potential energy density. In this case, my positive number is greater than my negative number, so the pressure at point 1 must be greater than the pressure at point 2 in order for P1 minus P2 to be a positive number. How can I go from the situation where the pressures are exactly equal to one where the pressure at point 1 must be greater than the pressure at point 2? Well, if we make our constriction at point 2 smaller and smaller, the potential energy density change would be the same because the fluids drop the same height but my change in kinetic energy density has to be larger and larger because my velocity increases. My third situation, of course, is where the change in the potential energy density, the magnitude of that is larger than the magnitude of the change in kinetic energy density. In this case here, the right-hand side would be a negative number, and the only way I can get that is if P2 is greater than P1. So that means the change in the kinetic energy density must be smaller than the change in the potential energy density. And how do we get that? by simply lowering the pipe. If I make point 0.2 lower, the change in the potential energy density would have been greater, but the kinetic energy density arising from the constriction would be the same because we kept that fixed. So a whole bunch of physical situations that we can apply for fluid flow, but ultimately they can be analyzed just using the continuity equation and Bernoulli's equation. To see that you understand this, I invite you to try problem 59 in chapter 15. And this will really help you cement your understanding of the continuity equation and Bernoulli's principle and how you can apply this to fluid flow.